Welcome to this episode of the Feminists for People's Vaccine podcast. My name is Sri Bafna. I am a research associate for Dawn, which is Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era. I am a young feminist, just entering into the realm of feminist thought, research, and advocacy. And today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Chantal Umohoza, who is a feminist activist and researcher and founder of Spectra Rwanda. Welcome to the Feminist for a People's Vaccine podcast, a space for imaginations, discussion, and feminist analysis from the global south. In this creative journey, we approach the tough questions brought to light by the pandemic. Join us to look at this once-in-a-lifetime event as a passageway to imagine a fair and just world for all. Chantal, it is lovely to be able to speak with you today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So my name is Chantal Omoza, and I'm a feminist activist based in Rwanda. I'm founder of a feminist group called Spectra, which is just a young feminist organization working on social justice issues from sexual productive justice, but also economic and ecological justice issues as well. We're also members of FemNet, which is an African women's rights network, feminist network that brings together feminist organizations and groups and individuals on work around feminism, social justice, and other human rights issues in general. So Chantal, today I want to talk to you a little bit about, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, but specifically how that's been affecting young women, girls, and young people in general, specifically in the African context. So to start off, we know that, of course, the pandemic has been raging on and off across the world, and the African continent itself is just now only seeing a decline in its third wave. So specifically, what are some of the challenges young women in Africa face during the pandemic? I really wouldn't say I can be able to speak from the continental perspectives, but I want to share some aspects about issues of how the pandemic and the measures that were taken have affected people, specifically young women and girls in Rwanda, but also sharing some of the highlights from what I've been able to gather and learn from African context. So in general, as we know, there were already pre-existing inequalities that were there in place in terms of gender inequalities, gender pay gaps, all the different inequalities that were already there. So when the pandemic hit, it really exposed all these issues that were already there. Inequalities in Africa were already made worse and have been made worse by a colonial history and current neocolonial and imperialism. So this approach to development that in Africa and African states have ongoing, it is exploitative. It is extractivist in nature. It is a model that does not really seek to solve the inequalities empower and adjust issues of geopolitical power inequalities, but it is about imperialism and capitalism where the global north pre-colonial states really put in place models that are about taking what they can out of the continent instead of supporting the states to really be able to address issues and inequalities that are already on ground and the effects of colonization in general. As an African continent, we depend largely on external funding and the health sector mostly. So we already have a debt crisis. Many states in Africa struggling to pay off debts. And then we have sponsored wars and violent conflicts. The pandemic exposed all these issues about who was hit hard. I remember in March 2020, when we were put under total lockdown, schools had to close and all that. So people already started seeing issues around how there was increased gender-based violence. There was increased child abuse in homes. Young girls were affected by this because they were staying at home. So it was evident that apparently young girls and children in general are safer in schools, but not in their homes. Then we had loss of jobs. When the pandemic hit and there were lockdowns and everything, you know, small businesses or small and medium businesses and from the private sector had to close down because there was no work going on. They had to shut down. And so majority of people that are employed in these places usually are young women. So they lost their jobs. So that also really showed how the economy itself has put young women in general 
in a situation where their survival depends solely on these kind of businesses. And when the pandemic hits and when there's any kind of change in the system, they are the ones that suffer most. Then we had close of public transportation, for example. That affected women and girls in terms of how they could access sexual and productive health services. Mm. So health facilities were open, but accessibility was an issue. So this also includes, for example, how they're not able to have access to contraception, but also HIV treatments and medicines for young women and girls living with HIV, which is also mostly young women and girls in Rwanda and those mostly coming from marginalized families. So the fact that the government did not foresee or any system did not foresee how this could affect young people in general and women and girls was really problematic. But really, uh, my main point on this is that the already pre-existing situations were just exposed by the pandemic. It's not that the pandemic affected it. It did affect them, but they were already there. Thank you, Chantal. That was... I mean, you touched on a range of issues and you also t- brought in the really important aspect of intersectionality where, you know, it's not just a homogenous group. Each individual has their own identity and their own experiences that, it, that of course, you know, inform the kind of access they have to resources. And of course, governments all around the world had a sheer lack of foresight when it comes to anticipating the exacerbation of these inequalities, as you just mentioned. And I want to ask a more specific question, which is basically about access to medicines. As we all know that the African continent and the global South as a whole, for that matter, is facing a shortage of COVID vaccines and is battling barriers of access to medicine as a whole. Would you be able to share your insights on this situation? And how does this affect the ability of disadvantaged groups and young women and girls when it comes to access to vaccines? Okay, so access to vaccines, really, it's something that we knew that was going to happen in terms of amical access, because not just a vaccine, but anything in general in terms of technology, in terms of medicines and treatment in general in Africa, for example, has always been really problematic because of also geopolitical power dynamics and issues between states and the ability of these countries to be able to afford or to actually put on ground capacities for themselves to build and work on their own medicines and all that. So issues around intellectual property rights and all that, that really has been an ongoing conversation even among feminist groups for a long time. Uh, When we finally had the vaccines for COVID-19, we knew that it was also going to be a struggle. So in March, like in 2021, I think that's when we started having this conversation about access to vaccines and medicine. So I already had talked about the unequal economic capabilities of countries and how already issues around condition of funding, the debt crisis, you know, the economic exploitations that are going on that puts global South countries and African countries in specifically in a vulnerable position or in a low position where the bargaining power, but also the capabilities of them being able to also take a stand and produce their own be it medicine or anything else has been an issue. We saw the hypocrisy, for example, of the European Union states that, you know, some of them that call themselves feminists or they say they have a feminist foreign policies, but really not supporting equal access and denying, for example, the removal of intellectual property rights on vaccines and not also willing to support the global south to build their own facilities and capacities to make their own. So it was capitalism as usual, you know just leaving the North best and supported and funded corporations to say they're the ones that are going to determine what price the vaccines can be. We saw how prices for vaccines were different depending on where. Global North countries, the price was not the same as we were. countries were able to do that. So in countries like in Rwanda, let's say in Uganda and Kenya as well, and some of the countries I know, the governments had no option but to borrow money to also add already to the existing debt crisis so that they can be able to buy the vaccines. That has been going on. We've heard of billions of dollars that governments are now borrowing to be able to afford this, but it shouldn't be like that, you know? So right now we depend on donations and on the small quantity the government that can buy, you know? In Rwanda, we have 12 million population size and less than 2 million people have been able to access vaccines, you know? 
because the affordability issue is still there. The capacity for countries to produce their own medicine is also still there and not resolved. And that also really continues to make it worse and put countries and people in general at a disadvantage. So when, for example, we first got some of the first batch of vaccines in Rwanda, what was really also funny was how For example, the first groups that were going to get the first vaccines, of course, there were politicians, the elderly people and the frontline workers, like teachers and people working in the health sector. But in addition to that, the first also vaccines were also given to diplomats and experts. We're talking about people that come from foreign countries that can't afford or can't be able to travel their countries to, to get vaccines. But no, the country had to do that, you know, and then... The rest of the population just have to wait until when the government can afford or when they can be able to get donations, you know. And we waited until now, ever since the vaccine started being there, we haven't yet been able to do that. And so if you talk about the already pre-existing inequalities and people that are mostly Mm. marginalized, Rwanda having more than 90% of people in the formal sector, they are the last Mm. people that are going to get vaccinated. Would you be able to speak a little bit more about how young feminist groups like Spectra and Femnet or other youth groups in Africa have mobilized to deal with some of the effects of the pandemic on our access to medicines? And any advice maybe you have for young feminists like myself or other people out there as to what they can do to involve themselves? It is really, really true that young people in general, and to be specific, young women, sometimes we just feel like, what can we do? How do you contribute? And intersecting discrimination when it comes to young women that we face. You're not just young. You don't know what you're talking about. But you're also a woman, like, you know, then it comes in the whole sexist and patriarchal ideas about what a woman and a young person can do. Exactly, yes. um, It's really hard, you know. Today we're talking about the pandemics and the vaccines and these issues, but also other topics in the past, it has really been difficult to get young women in these spaces as if Mm -hmm. they don't have enough to contribute or say. Mm -hmm. For me, I always say your existence and your life already is a reality enough to contribute and bring to the table you do not have to have gone to have a phd or anything everybody's life and experiences on a daily basis is evidence enough about what needs to be done and that person has already the experience about how they have been able to live you know learn from that and contribute to discussion about everything because if you look at it Everything we talk about is intersecting in different ways and interlinked in different ways. Uh, Vaccines, life, health, well-being, and all that. So when it came to the pandemic, I think for young feminists, let me say in Rwanda, I think it took some time to realize Mm -hmm. the effects. It took some Mm -hmm. time because everyone, including us as activists, we were struggling to also find peace with what was happening. We're struggling mm. to, to yes. think what is going to happen to our lives, what's going to happen, how we're going to survive. So I think mm-hmm. it kind of took some time to kind of think what we need to do and how we need to mobilize and do. So in March 2020, when we first got our lockdown in Rwanda, for example, I remember my tweet said it was addressed to policymakers and decision makers in ministries. And I was asking them, how do you expect people who eat only when they have worked on a mm. daily basis are going yes. to survive in this lockdown. Yes. We're talking about people who only make like less than a dollar a day and they have to survive on that with their families on a daily basis. And then mm-hmm. so if you put people at home, like how do you expect them to survive? So I put the tweet out there. I didn't even know what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. But it kind of brought a lot of discussions among Rwandans and there was a lot of support and there were increased voices really calling on the government to expand social protection, you know, to provide mm-hmm. some basic needs during lockdown because people were, were really like starving, you know. So and then with the vaccines and everything, when it also was started hearing that people can be able to get vaccines, you know, we organized different webinars, different meetings among feminists to really discuss about these whole issues around access so we mobilize around that and uh, we continue to do that and also highlight that you know 
medicines and vaccines in general has always been a struggle, but not until we organize and mobilize and call on our governments, not on our government, but also globally call on and name and shame countries that continue to perpetuate inequalities. That's how we continue to organize and learn from other movements as well in the different parts of Africa. It takes a lot, more than it should, for bigger government bodies or UN agencies to listen to women. And that could be inbuilt sexism. It could be, you know, general assumptions made on their part. So I would also like to just kind of take this in a more positive direction. You know, taking all of these issues into account, just, you know, the exacerbated inequality, the distinction between what is essential and not essential, and how that affects young women and girls in particular, and finally to the issue of access to vaccines itself. I just want to ask you, how do you think young African feminists and or feminists around the world can imagine a post-pandemic world? What do you think they should or can expect? Currently, the talk or the motto now of um, post-pandemic world is building back better. But as feminists, what we really should be talking about, what we should be asking for, is building back transformatively. Because we do not want to go back to normal, like people say. We want to go back by learning lessons about what the pandemic has shown us, what we already knew and what feminists have always for a long time been calling in terms of inequalities, discriminations, And, you know, really ensuring human dignity in all aspects. And so we don't want to just build back better. We are calling for building back transformatively. Let's build back. But as we transform systems, structures, mindsets, and all these issues, and really showing that the inequalities that are in place can be addressed. Because otherwise, we'll just be playing games and going back to the same situation as if we didn't learn anything. So to do better... We need to really take the lessons from this pandemic, the impact of how such pandemics, for example, in contexts that already have inequalities, who suffers more and why. So, for example, why can't children and young people be safe in their homes? How do we correct that? Is it about the sexist and patriarchal system in place and mindsets that really puts young people in situations where they can be exploited either by their neighbors or even by their own parents? How do we correct that? Because we cannot just based on schools. Everybody needs to be safe anywhere. And the home, I think, is the first place that everybody should feel safe and protected. Why are young girls getting more impregnated and raped in their homes? And then we say we need girls to go back to school. That's the solution. It shouldn't be the solution. We should also correct what we have at home. For example, why are women more likely to be fired from jobs, from small businesses and all during a crisis? And the ones that are more likely to get poorer, you know, why is that? Why do we have a gender pay gap? How do we correct that? Transformatively, it's not just go back to what we had, but also to take lessons about who was really hit by the pandemic and why. But I think the pandemic was like some kind of hardcore evidence to show. Mm-hmm. And then we're like, you see, that's what we meant when we said we need to address issues. We need to address our safety and protections of everybody in the homes and all that. We need to address and talk about neocolonial and imperial development models that we have in place in Global South, for example, that really continue to keep our states in a vulnerable situation and at the mercy of the Global North, you know? How do we correct that? We don't want to go back to how things were, but how do we make sure that states, big and small, different contexts, how do we talk about a really equal kind of say on the table in terms of politics and in terms of what countries can be able to do for their own people? Then we need to recognize and continuously highlight that we have many pandemics. For example, in Africa, let's talk about in Africa, there's a climate crisis. There is wars and conflicts. There's gender inequalities and gender-based violations that are also pandemics. If you look at them in the Mm -hmm. who gets to call this a pandemic? And I cannot really emphasize more on how we need to talk about social protection of Mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that at least whatever is going on, human beings, young women and girls, have at least the basic in terms of things that really assure a dignified life. Just food, safety, a decent housing, access to water. In 2021, we're still addressing these issues. The last point is that we've been talking about sustainable development and sustainable development goals, but this cannot be achieved at all 
unless we want to continue playing game. It cannot be achieved if we do not really address these deep inequalities, discriminations, and issues that continue to put human lives at risk in different contexts. Chantal, I 100% agree. I mean, everything you just said, it just it leads back to the conclusion that the old system is not working. The current system that now you know people are just trying to kind of recycle and put into a new literally it's called new colonialism because it's not working anymore everyone needs to wake up and realize that like we cannot go back we have to be transformative as you said and i think the reason why it's so important to have this discussion regarding young people and young women and girls is because we are the future right it is up to us now to dismantle this old system and bring a more transformative lens to everything starting with the fact that not everyone is on a level playing field, as you said, you know, and I also just want to summarize and say that what you said about this particular COVID-19 pandemic showing us how makeshift our policies have been in addressing inequalities that arise due to intersectionality, they are not robust, they are not resilient, they fell apart the minute it was pushed at the slightest. So it is unfortunate that it took so long. It took a pandemic in the 21st century for us to realize this. Actually, Chantal, I just wanted to know more about Spectra and, you know, where the idea of it came from, exactly, you know, the history of it. That would be really interesting mm-hmm. to know. So I, prior to studying Spectra, I had worked in the civil society organization in Rwanda for more than 15 years. You know, I started working when I was really young, I think when I was like 17. And after I did my master's, I really felt like, I think I was privileged enough to be able to get into the feminist movement when I was still young and I could see there were issues around intergenerational gaps and knowledge gap about how young women and girls can also be part of the discourse and narrative change and everything. We had majority of organizations that were working with, there were organizations that were led by elder women who would only occasionally bring in young girls, you know, things that I would thought or I felt was more about tokenism but not really engaging them meaningfully for them to take the lead. So Spectra was founded from this experience to create a space for intergenerational dialogue, but also to really uh, make specifically for young women and girls to be there. You do not have to be educated. You do not have to have to do anything. And to also to address this elitism, I don't know how I can call it, of feminism, where we feel like you have to have gone to school, you have to have a master's in gender equality for you to be part of the feminist movement. Like, no. Any woman, any girl, anywhere should and has to be part of this movement. Like I said, everyone's life is enough for them to share the experience. And so Spectra is based on that whole idea that young women and girls have to be on the table and doesn't have to be those that have gone to school. It should be everybody to talk about the issues, to do activism uh, and to do anything that they want to contribute in terms of changing the issues that keep affecting their lives in different ways. So that's the idea. We're just still a feminist group registered as an, an organization here. Yet, but we're working on that. So that's Spectra. So I'm 24, which means I am entering the realms of full-fledged adulthood. So I feel I still get the you're too young, you don't know what you're talking about dialogue a lot, especially from my family. Um, and of course, you know, as, as a woman, it has it still holds some connotations, right? In terms of how they do talk to you or the kind of things they expect from you at a certain age. It's a constant struggle. Mm-hmm. I mean, even in Rwanda, we still have the same issues, you know. You're young and crazy, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, my parents' idea of what I do as a 24-year-old is very different from what I actually do, so. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I've had a lot of that thrown in my face everywhere I went, in conferences where I felt like you're just there to to feel the lines, to be tokenized, to sit on the table so that you can say we have a young person, but then I (laughs) felt like we're not even listening to what I'm saying. I guess it's like a two-way thing, right? Because that also deters younger people to play an active role or to be interested in these spaces. It's always like, oh, you know, I'm not learned enough. I haven't gone to school enough. I haven't done X, Y, Z things enough. So Yeah, and I've met young people who also feel like, oh, it's a privilege for me to be here. Like, no, it's not a privilege. Mm-hmm. You deserve to be there. <laughs> 
so and then we get there i remember like when i first went to a un in new york meeting and i had to be on a panel speaking about young people's sexual and productive rights issues and stuff like that and i felt so lost and there was no guidance in terms of everything and we're just talking about oh this young person from Rwanda. she's just talk about it she, i just felt like I felt bad and like really stupid about how the whole thing was about and I just felt like it shouldn't be like this. I'm not here to be like, you know, proud or anything. I'm just here to talk about issues that have been going on in my life, in my family, in my community, just like you all are in the whole UN thing that, you know, some people do. At that time, I also felt like, oh, it's amazing that I'm here. But now I think looking back, I'm like, no. Young people should not feel like that. Everybody can be should and has to be hard, you know. It's a fine line, I think, between respecting your elders and also understanding your true value as yeah. a young person. It's also a cultural thing, right? I mean, like in Indian society, it's it's a lot of emphasis on respecting your elders and not questioning mm-hmm. them. Yes. And so, yeah, and you're constantly told you know you're being done a favor you know you have to be thankful of course you should mm. be thankful but you know yeah it's a debt to repay that's sometimes mm-hmm. how it's <laughs> yes. put across <laughs> yeah very very true it's i mean it's the same culture in Rwanda that most african mm-hmm. states that i know of. respect your elder do not speak to them in a certain way but these are things for example that you know come from the whole socializations about how we treat young people even from birth like when they're still like young people toddlers how do we empower young people even when they're still young to understand that whatever they have to say matters Chantal it was lovely having you and thank you so much for these wonderful insights whatever you have shared with us today is also very full of hope which I appreciate personally as well as a young feminist so Thank you very much. It's been an absolute privilege to have you. The Feminists for a People's Vaccine podcast is produced by Dawn, Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era, and TWN, the Third World Network. Today's episode was edited by Alice Furtado and engineered by Ernesto Sena. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Vanita Nayak Mukherjee. See you on the next episode.